So in continuing fashion, as we have for the past two weeks, going to take up a couple of words tonight. And our two words tonight are the words victory and defeat. Victory and defeat. I'd have to say tonight, um, it is my responsibility to take up that word defeat. Um, and it's it's not easy. It's not easy to speak about defeat because defeat has very little to do with Jesus Christ. But we're going to speak on a very unique portion of Scripture that tells us something about the way that he defeated uh, the powers of darkness, how he defeated the thing that we all fear, and how a lot of people aren't really aware. A lot of people think that that somehow Christ lost or was defeated. And we'd like to write that wrong tonight by reading these verses. So if you have a Bible, I'd like to read a couple of verses in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. We're going to read these verses together, and then we're going to comment on them in the opening part of this meeting. Hebrews 2 and verse 14 says this. These are good verses to read later. They're almost a a comprehensive look at Christianity or the life of Christ is really summed up here. In just a couple of verses and how you come into the good of that life. Here is what it says. Hebrews 2 and 14 says, for as much then as the children, that's you and I, you and I are partakers of flesh and blood. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also, that's the Lord Jesus himself, Likewise, took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their life type subject to bondage. Those are tremendous verses that we've read about the Lord Jesus. He, he became a man. That's what the verse says in verse 14, that we were human. We had flesh and blood, and he himself came and became a man just as us. You say, what was the purpose of that? What was the purpose of Christ's incarnation? And then the verse tells us that he, that he might die, that he might die, and that he might defeat him who had the power of death. That is Satan. And why? So that we could be freed from this bondage of fear. There is not a soul that has ever lived who can't say they had to have fought one day I'm going to die. I'm not going to be here one day. And then what? What will life be at that point? I want to speak on that this evening, defeat. Because what's unique about the, the life of Christ is that it, it, most people's lives are consumed with what they did in their life. And then at the end of these books that you read, there's, there's a, short, a short little section about how they died and where they died and, and where you can go visit a tomb. But the life of Christ, these these gospels that we have read from night after night, they deal in almost entirety. They're short little introductions, but the majority of the material is about the day that he died. It's great because they're not called biographies. Biographies tell you about the life of a man. These, these narratives are called gospels. They're good news because there's only good news in one man's death, and that's the death of Christ. If tonight you are not saved, it is because you still believe that Christ was defeated. If you are not saved tonight, it's because you have not realized there was a battle fought and Christ won. Because if you realize that he won, it's all over. We know who won. We know the victory was in his hands. And he died and he won. You could be saved tonight. But defeat. Is for those who think that, no, Christ did not win that day at Calvary. And to the untrained eye, actually to all eyes, most people would say, looking at that scene, that he could not have won. There's no way that anyone would look at that day and say, Jesus Christ was the one who had the victory. But hopefully tonight, we can speak on victory and defeat and be able to say something about the life of Christ. When I come to this term defeat, um, a lot of actually thoughts flood my own mind. Um, I, I can think of uh, a seventh, eighth grade basketball season and every game we played, we lost. And after every loss, our coach told us, he said, it's not like we're going to lose every one. And we did. We went 0 and 12. And actually, when I lose now in any kind of event, the first thing I think of 
is what it was like as a 13 year old to lose constantly. And no one likes to lose. No one likes to be defeated. No one, no one relishes that fact. It's people want to be on the winning side. And that is really most people's problem with Christianity. They look at a man on a cross. They look at nails in his hands and his feet. They look at the creator crucified and they say, I want nothing to do with that because that looks like defeat. And yet the Bible says there's victory in Jesus, my savior forever. There is victory in one man, Jesus Christ. And yet he didn't do it with a sword. He didn't do it with a, he didn't do it with an army. He did it with a death. And the Bible says that. How unique that he did it with a death. When we look at that day, that final day that Christ had on earth, everything looked like defeat. In fact, he was apprehended. He was betrayed. And men came and they bound his arms there. They they arrested him, we could say. And and, and how, how awful, if you've ever had a hero in life, if you've had someone to admire, you'd say, to see them arrested, to see them brought into prison, you'd say, defeated. There's a defeat there, that the authorities would come and would take a man, and they would apprehend him, they would bind him, and they would put him in prison, taken, taken from prison. And the scriptures could say, who's going to talk about this man? Who's going to declare this man the one who was taken and was put in prison? Well, we do tonight. We do, because not only was he taken and apprehended, some people are unaware that the Lord Jesus, he went through six trials, six different trials. Three of them were in a religious court, and three of them were in a state court, like a, a government court. Six trials. In one night, he was tried six different times. And you know what? This earth. It's religious and it's government courts. You know what they said? Guilty. Guilty. And yet ask them, why? Why is he guilty? They couldn't come up with witnesses. They couldn't come up with reasons. Everything was done in order so that this was being an un... It was the most unjust trial known to man. But he was tried six times and you would say defeated. Defeated. That even the court of law, even the religious court, you'd say they, they defeated him. They found him guilty. And when they had to put what his guilt was, when they stapled it on the cross, that sign, and the world looked on to say this man was defeated and he was found guilty. Why? You know, all that they could put above him was his name. Imagine having to die for who you are. You know, the Bible says that each one of us will die one day because of who we are. We're sinners. But thank God of another man who died because of who he was, the Savior. And so they put above that cross the charge from those six trials, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Defeated. That's what it looked like. He was arrested. He was arraigned. He was tried. Even the judge that day, Pilate, he was defeated. It says he could, he could prevail nothing. He gave up. He washed his hands. He gave up. He was defeated. He said, Take them, take them and crucify them. Even the judge who was supposed to be able to determine right and wrong said, just take them. I can't win. I'm defeated. And there on a cross for six hours hung the savior of the world. Anybody who passed that by that day would have never, ever even thought of mentioning the word victory. He hung there and he died and he suffered for six hours on a cross. You know, it's tremendous. Because all of his disciples, they fled the scene. But this was the man with the largest army that has ever been known. The largest army that has ever been known. And he told individuals that. He could have called them. But no, no one saw. No one saw one soldier show up that day at Calvary. He had uh, the ability just in his own hands, in his own words, to stop the weather. And yet... There was, no, there was no hand gestures that day. You'd say he was defeated, a defeated man. It's tremendous. When we look at this man and we look at Calvary and we look at all that went on there was just this, what we have read there in Hebrews 2, that he took his enemy's greatest weapon and he used that to win. Because every one of us have feared death, feared 
feared this end of our lives. We, we've all looked at the end and said, what will happen when my life is nothing more than a dash between two numbers? What will it mean? What will I rest on to get there? It's such a frightening thing. Everyone has felt it at the most susceptible and vulnerable moments in life, as we walk through hospital doors, as we go to funerals, as we look at danger and sin all around us, there is no one who can say that they have not feared the end and wondered what will happen when it's all over. And here is Jesus Christ, and he takes that. He takes death, the greatest weapon that Satan has ever had, and he uses that to win. That's a tremendous truth. Tremendous truth tonight, that victory is in Christ. Paul has said at the end of his book in 1 Corinthians, he says, death, where is its sting? And the grave, where is its victory? It's not to be found in the eyes or hearts of a believer because of what Jesus Christ did when he died. When he died for sinners, what a tremendous truth that we read of, of one who was obedient unto death, even the death of a cross. And so as everyone looked on that Friday, if you had been there, I would guarantee you, you would have looked at a man hanging on a tree and you could have said, had you had to write the analysis for the newspaper the next day, if you had to come up with a title for the newspaper the next day, you could have just said this, as far as Christianity is concerned, we lost, we are defeated. That Friday afternoon when a man hung on, on the cross, when a man was suspended between heaven and earth, when no one stepped in to help, when his own father did not step in to help, when angels refused to lift a weapon, when disciples scattered and left him, had you been there to evaluate it, you could have just come up with these two words, we lost. And three days later, you could have put the same title and you could have said, we've won. Because three days later, Christ rose again. Christ died is bad news. The gospel cannot be preached with Christ died. Because if he did not rise again, then I have no message for you. But if he is alive, we won. The victory is ours. There's not another man who's ever lived. All other religions look like hobbies compared to Christianity, because it tells me about a man who died, who let men do whatever they would to him, was buried. Three days later, he rose again. And tonight, he says to anyone and to everyone, anywhere and everywhere, you could be freed from the bondage of the fear of death, of the fear of a meaningless life, of the fear of your sins, you could be freed from that in a moment because he endured all that for you at Calvary. You could believe that. You could believe what is written on these pages and you could be saved. How tremendous, how tremendous that these words, they're so true, they'll outlast every one of us. And the opportunity tonight, as you continue to listen to Matt speak, that there is victory in one man, Jesus Christ. The world looked on and said, we lost. You know, I'd said that for a majority of my life, but it wouldn't have mattered what I knew. I lived the life that just said, we lost. But thank God, I come to a time in my life where I realized that the man who was crucified in shame and in dishonor on the third day rose again victorious over death. He used death to defeat Satan. He used death to defeat him, and he died, and sin has no hold on him. Death has no hold, and I can tell you tonight, you can be assured of salvation 100% because Christ is a 100% Savior. He died, not 90% death, but 100% death. He rose again 100%, and his word is 100% reliable. You could believe what he says that he died for you and be 100% sure of your salvation. Trust him tonight. Be sure of it and enjoy this. We know that the battle's over. We know we've won. We know how it all ends. Continue to listen as Matt tells us 
There is victory in Christ, not victory in a church, not victory in a person on this earth, but victory in God's son who defeated him who had the power of death, that is Satan, by himself dying, being buried, and rising again. We look to know that you would be saved tonight, but continue the lesson as we realize the victory that there is in Christ. Thanks, Dave. We're going to read just two verses tonight. Uh, and the first one is in the book of First Corinthians chapter 15. And just for context, or just maybe to put it, bring it together, I'll read verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, verse 57, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only other reading I have is Romans in chapter 5 and verse 6. And it says these words. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, in perfect timing, in God's timing, Christ died for the ungodly. Another version would say these words, for while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So when we think of this word victory, and we think of this word defeat, victory would be have the thought of overcoming an enemy or overcoming an antagonist. It'd have the thought of conquering in battle or some contest. It would have the thought of vanquishing or annihilating a foe. When we consider victory in the gospel, when we say there is victory in Jesus, I love that Dave mentioned those words because we're going to touch that in a moment. But in the gospel, sin brings death, and death passes on all men because all have sinned. These are all types of sin. Don't just think of the worst sinner you know. This is if you're on the call today and you're not saved by the grace of God, God is saying that you are a sinner. You have fallen short of his glory. Every sin that you've ever committed, every sin in the heart, every big sin you might think it is, or every small sin, it's sin to God and it taints heaven. And so God says that sin brings death and death passes on all men for that all have sinned. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. We think of the victory found in Christ, that where sin was there at the cross, grace did much more abound. Christ came to conquer the enemy. That thought of victory, to conquer sin's curse, to conquer the penalty of its sin, to conquer the taskmaster who produces chronic slavery to sin, Christ came to defeat the enemy. The enemy, the devil, was defeated at the cross. Sin no longer has a claim on the soul that comes to trust in Christ and his risen estate. Without the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have no message. Christ came, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. The Bible teaches that there's a second coming, that Christ will bind Satan and place him into the pit. Eventually, Satan to be cast into the lake of fire. The serpent's head is crushed. Genesis 3 and verse 15 says these words, when we think of victory found at the cross through Christ, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Without the resurrection of Christ, we have nothing. Thank God that there is victory found at the place called Calvary through the person of Christ. F.B. Meyer said those words, though justification costs nothing but the sacrifice of our pride, it costs Christ his blood. And friend, today, if you're on the call, if you haven't recognized the blood of Christ on a cross was enough to put away your sin forever, tonight could be the night. You could understand for the very first time in your life, regardless of how old or how young you are on this call today, that you have sins forgiven. You have a home in heaven. It's all because of Christ's victory over sin on a cross. That could be yours tonight. The gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. The message is about the victory God provides through Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. Never forget it. We read those words together on the call. Christ died for the ungodly. But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When humanity of the world was in defeat, defeated because man had no hope, defeated because humanity had no peace, defeated because humanity had no joy, no true joy, defeated because we we're empty, we're seeking to fill Every personal vacuum that is represented on this call with unsatisfying worldly pleasures. We were without strength, the Bible teaches. No sacrifice capable to pay for sin forever. God says this, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son. 
the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Victory. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11 says these words. And every priest stands day after day. The thought there's every single day serving and offering the same sacrifices again and again. Sacrifices that could never take away sins. Verse 12. But this priest, this one, Christ, had offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, for all of eternity. The person of Christ sat down at the right hand of God where he is now waiting until his enemies are made a footstool for his feet. One might ask the question, but what about all my sin? Will I be haunted by the penalty of my sin? Will I have to endure the wrath of God for my past sins? I get it. Perhaps saved today. I could come to trust Christ today. But what about my past? Hebrews continues just for the person that is just questioning. He says this in verse 17 and 18. Their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no longer. Victory found in the person of Christ. Now where there is forgiveness, he says, of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Have you ever recognized the victor over your sins penalty yet? I'll tell you this, it's recognition of Christ that is vital to saving your soul. We have to recognize him. I attended a soccer game in New York City uh, on July 22nd, 2017 with uh, Dave actually on the, speaking on the call and Melvin and James and some others that are on the call today. We saw FC Barcelona play Juventus. I don't remember much except for this. There was a lot of pressure in the stadium because Barcelona Bologna fans hadn't seen their main man yet. So one by one as players were announced, they're announcing the players and they're sort of just barely clapping. But when the announcer announced Lionel Messi, a crowd of 82,104 people rose to their feet, banging bleachers, chanting Messi, Messi, Messi. It was a very powerful scene, cheering. The stadium reverberated with worthship, if I can use that word. Not worship, but the thought there of worthship to Messi. He had proven himself. We literally watched that man dance around, around his foes as he's playing. He just beautifully moved as he's a playing soccer. He's an incredible athlete. In the face of defeat, brought that team victory. And the audience chanted his name. 82,104 people stood to their feet and shouted, Messi, Messi, Messi. Stark contrast. Stark contrast. When the King of Kings was announced at Pilate's Judgment Hall, what shall I do then, Pilate asked, with Jesus, which is called Christ, as the King of Kings stood before his creation? Humanity at its best is shown here, friend. Heaven's watching. Angels that would have worshipped him in eternity past as they cried out in Isaiah 6, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At his birth, angels cried out, glory to God in the highest peace upon earth and goodwill towards man. Angels comforting him before the cross. And yet at Calvary, they're silent. And Pilate asks the question, what will I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? A crowd who anticipates a Messiah, longing to be free from sin's bondage and curse. Yet when they see Christ, he said, Matt, tell me, please, what's the thoughts that they shouted out? Crucify him. And those words traveling to the heart of God that was beating and throbbing for your soul. The first time in eternity, a work of salvation is coming to fruition. God is watching and he's in full control. The mercy of God, holding back wrath. We learned about that with Dave, holding back wrath due to the man. And he places the wrath that would have been due upon the, the sinner who would have spit on Christ. And he places that wrath on his only son. Victory found at the cross. The grace of God, pride of providing victory over our sin and its penalty through the precious blood shed on the cross. And God gives us salvation through the person of Christ. John MacArthur said these words, the cross is proof of both the immense love of God and the profound wickedness of sin. Think about David as he conquers Goliath. If you know the story in the Old Testament, perhaps you're younger on the call and you love the stories of David because he was just a young man, but he's running at an enemy that would have, that would have taunted man. This enemy is a picture of the enemy. David is a picture of Christ conquering the enemy at the cross. And for 40 days, Goliath taunted God's people, send me a man to fight. And for 4,000 years, let me say this, if I can say so just through scripture, the enemy taunted the Godhead, send me a man. And God said, here's my son. And he gave his son. The Bible teaches when we were without strength in perfect timing, Christ died for the ungodly. Are you the ungodly on the call today? When man today fears death, they fear the unknown. I would, 
on the authority of the word of God. Let me say this. Freud mentioned something and he was wrong. He said these words. And finally, there is the painful riddle of death for which no remedy at all has yet been found nor probably ever will be. Compare that with what Paul says here. Paul says death is swallowed in victory. Victory found where? Through the person of Christ. Trapp mentioned it even more accurately when he studied the word of God. He said these words, this is the sharpest and the shrillest note, the boldest and the bravest challenge when he speaks about death, that ever man rang in the ears of death. Death here is outbraved. Death here is called craven to his face and bidden to do it's worse. What does 1 Corinthians 15 say? Thanks be to God. Why? Which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I could introduce you if I took you, and maybe you're listening and perhaps from all over the country, I'm not sure, but if I took you and I took you down to Chicago, just at a little mission that I'm involved with, I could take you to dozens of people that would have been defeated for most of their life, addicted to vices in this world, starting at young ages, 10, 11, 12 years old, and they found victory through the person of Christ, perhaps 40 years, addicted to substances use. Now they find victory in Jesus. They've been saved for over 15 years. They came to the cross just the way they were, broken in their sin, and they found restoration. They found reconciliation. They found the burden of their sin had rolled away, and they came to trust Christ. I could take you to a man named Charles. He woke up one day in the vomit of his sin in the basement of his family's home in his 40s. He lifted his hands. He asked God where he should go. Have you ever just asked God to show you something in the word of God? He walked for eight miles with his hands raising. God, show me where I'm supposed to go because I'm broken. And he landed at the mission. He saw the sign, Christ died for our sins on there. He walked into a service, never hearing the gospel in his life. He came to trust Christ. Victory, you say, where? Victory in a church? No. Victory in a pastor? No. Victory in a priest? No. Victory in a preacher? No. It's victory, friend. Listen carefully. In Christ. He's been saved ever since. A job. He's clean. He's got a family. He's got a home. No longer separated, but reconciled. No longer lost, but found. No longer poor, but rich in Christ. No longer sorrowful, but joyful. No longer under the loss of sin, but he found profit. I'm using words we just spoke on these past couple of weeks prophet in christ no longer in defeat but what but found victory in jesus eugene monroe bartlett 1885 to 1941 born christmas eve successful businessman he decides to invest all his money into founding the hartford music company and the music institute becomes editor of the herald song music magazine his victory in christ not in his worldly accomplishments he got saved at a young age made a huge impact on southern gospel music producing over 800 songs he wrote this song, I'm going to quote it to you, in 1939, two years before his death. He suffers a stroke. It leaves him partially paralyzed and confined to a bed. And he's discouraged. He can't travel as much. He can't sing as much. He can perform gospel hymns. He's alone with God. God wants to be alone with you tonight. He's alone with God in his word. He pens these words. Listen very carefully. One of my favorite hymns. And you know what? We sing it with hundreds of men down at a little mission in Chicago, men that are broken. Are you broken tonight? Listen to these words. I heard, as he rates these words, victory in Jesus, I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory. What about you? How many times have you heard the gospel? Times of God loving you so much, he sent his only son. How many times does it take for God to speak? I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. Dave spoke on it. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. I heard about his groaning, that's all for you. Of his precious blood's atoning, yes again, all for you. Then I repented of my sins, or had a change of heart of who I am and who Christ is, and I came to trust him and I won the victory. I heard about his healing, he continues. He healed many in scripture, blind, halt, but the greatest healing that God provides is through the person of his Christ, when he heals a sinner from the penalty of their sin and they're forgiven. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. Are you addicted to your sin? Maybe addicted to pride, maybe addicted to lust, maybe addicted to covetousness, maybe addicted to wickedness, maybe addicted to lying, maybe addicted to the heart sins that no one knows but God knows. Maybe addicted to your good works and hypocritical sins of his cleansing power revealing. The cleansing power of the work of Christ. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, the writer says, Dear Jesus, as he reflects on his own conversion, come and heal my broken spirit, broken hearted because of sin. 
broken hearted because of the regrets of sin, broken hearted because of the burdens, the weight, the capacity of sin. And somehow, he says, I can't understand it, he said, but somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. I heard about a mansion, he writes, he has built for me in glory. I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea, about the angels singing and the old redemption story. And some sweet day, I'll sing up there the song of victory. The chorus reads this, oh, victory in Jesus, my savior forever. Is he your savior tonight? The writer says he sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. His verse for that hymn was this, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I know people down at a little mission, perhaps poor in this life, they have literally nothing physically, but they've got eternal life. I would tell you this, they might be poor in this life, but they're richer than any sinner that perishes in their sins. Solemn note to think of this. Another writer wrote these words, will the circle be unbroken? Listen carefully. We sang songs of childhood, hymns of faith that made us strong. Ones that Mother Mabel taught us. The writer's just saying this as he reflects on how he grew up. Maybe you grew up singing hymns. He continues, hear the angels sing along. Will the circle be unbroken? By and by, Lord, by and by. There's a better home waiting, heaven. In the sky, Lord, in the sky. You know what's sad? Is that perhaps on this call, there are already broken circles. Perhaps on this call, there are parents saved, but children are not. Perhaps on this call, maybe one is saved in the family. The rest of the family is not. Come to Christ today. Leave this world with a family unbroken. Leave this world bound for heaven. Why? Because you found victory in Jesus. I would tell you this. That two sworn enemies of your soul are this, yesterday and tomorrow. Yesterday claims its thousands. The regrets of past sins, that the sinner dies who looks at yesterday, not looking to the cross, and they perish outside of Christ. But tomorrow is even worse. Tomorrow claims its tens of thousands. Tomorrow has its good intent. Maybe there's someone on the call today and you're saying, Matt, I love hearing the gospel, but I'll get saved tomorrow. And the soul that says tomorrow, you know the Bible says don't boast about tomorrow. You don't know what will come forth out of it. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. That soul that looks to tomorrow's enemy, that soul slips into eternity too late. And the mocking voice cries out, too late. Too late. Don't be late, dear one. Come to Christ. Billy Graham said God proved his love on the cross, a victory on the cross when Christ hung, when Christ bled, when Christ died. It was God saying to the world, I love you. Are you willing to love him back? to just rest in the finished work of Christ. The Bible says this, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Come to understand the victory found in Christ. He came, he died, he was buried, and he rose again to give you eternal life.